Well, today we are launching a brand new series, and we're entitling it The Battle Within, The Battle Within. And I believe this is going to be a very important, helpful, and even life-changing series that we're going to dive into during the month of March. And I want to encourage you, if possible, come back every single week, because the truth is we all have a battle within us, and we need to have our minds and our hearts wrapped around the things that are going on within us. So this week we're going to be talking, or this month we're going to be talking about mental health, anxiety, fear, self-doubt, some of the things that are happening within us, and that plague not just us, but also some of the people that we love. Because the truth is we all wrestle with something, right? Maybe right now you're wrestling, you feel like there's a struggle going on. Maybe it's to overcome a hurt or a habit or a hang-up. Maybe it's to find freedom from addiction, to find strength, to do what is right, to live in peace instead of anxiety, to walk in confidence instead of being ridden with insecurity. And it's really important that not only do we address what's going on around us, which is a lot of times what gets our focus and our attention, but that we also address what's going on within us. And that we don't address what's going on within us just for ourselves, but also for the sake of others. Because what happens in us overflows to those around us. It doesn't just stay with us. If we can't live in peace with ourselves, it will be difficult to have peace with other people, right? We just came out of a relationship series, and it was so helpful, and we had some fun. If you miss out on it, go back and watch it on YouTube or on the website. But I believe that one of the most difficult relationships that we can have is the relationship with yourself, because you are everywhere that you go. And so you have to learn how to like yourself. It's so important. There's a famous quote, maybe you've heard it before, but it says, a man who is at war with himself will inevitably be at war with others. And so we must take the time and address the battle that's happening within us. And so this concept and this tension that we feel is nothing new. In fact, Paul from the New Testament was very expressive about his struggle regarding the battle within. And we're going to read some of his words found in Romans chapter 7. And he says this, And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need some help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in action. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that now all of me joins in that delight. Part of me covertly rebels, and just when I least expect it, takes charge. I think we all resonate with what Paul is describing here when it comes to the struggle within. Maybe you go back and forth believing, I have what it takes, and then the very next day you feel like, I'm never going to measure up. Maybe you come to church on Sunday and you're feeling strong, and then you walk into Monday, and it's hard to resist that temptation. Maybe you start the day off trying to be positive, but by 8.05 a.m., you feel like the negativity is pulling you down already. You're desperate for peace, but you can't shake the anxious thoughts. And if you've struggled, if you've struggled long enough, With whatever it is, I think we all start to ask the question, is this how it will always be? Am I meant to just struggle well? Am I meant to just struggle well? Is that my future? Do I just need to learn how to best cope with the battle within? Or is it possible that I might have victory over the very things that are battling within me. I want to continue reading what Paul said in this passage. He goes on to say in verse 24, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can 
And he does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Paul says that our hope comes from Jesus, that he is our answer, that his work on the cross gives us freedom, gives us victory. Yes, in this world we will have troubles, but we can take heart Because Jesus has overcome the world, and he can give you the power to overcome that which is trying to overwhelm or plague you. And in this series, we're going to get practical on how to have victory. We're going to give you some keys to winning the battle within. And I think it's so important that we understand that winning can actually be a good thing. How many of you are competitive? You like to win. Any competitive people in the place? Some of you are nudging the person next to you, like your hand should be up right now. Our family is competitive. We haven't had a family game of Monopoly in 10 years because it never ends well, because everyone ends up fighting, because everybody is competitive. And we have two sons, Nash and Ryder, and Nash is six and Ryder is four. And Nash is extremely competitive. He loves to win, and he's also very athletic. Doesn't take after me, takes after his father. And so last year, we decided to sign the boys up for baseball. It was for four, five, and six-year-olds. And it's like baseball, but they don't really keep score. It's more like an organized practice. But our oldest son, Nash, was so excited. And he was like, oh, I've been waiting to play baseball. I was like, for how old? And for how long? He was only five years old at that time. And so like two weeks before his first baseball game, I go up into Nash's room. He's in there all by himself, five years old at the time. I open up the door. He's on the floor, all alone, doing push-ups, just pumping, just doing push-ups. I was like, buddy, what are you doing? He was like, oh, I'm getting ready for baseball. I got to be strong so I can hit a home run. I was like, oh, my goodness. The next day, I go into his room. He has two stuffed animals, and he's holding them, and he's, like, doing curls with the stuffed animals. I was like, Nash, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm getting strong, Mom. We got to get ready for baseball. It's only 10 days away. So on the first game that day, I pulled him aside. I was like, okay, buddy, listen. You're playing with four, five, and six-year-olds, and the whole point of this is just to have a ton of fun, just have so much fun, be a great teammate, cheer everybody on, and try your hardest. And he looks at me so serious, and he was like, the point of baseball is to win, and that I would also hit a home run. I was like, oh boy, here we go. You might be disappointed tonight, go talk to your father. I'm not sure what advice to give you, except for try hard, have fun. And so sure enough, we go to the game that night, And I mean, it's what you would imagine baseball to be with four, five, and six-year-olds. Like, it's chaos. There's kids out doing snow angels, like in the gravel, like gravel angels. They're supposed to be playing baseball. They're picking flowers. Like, it's just hilarious. The kids are getting tossed the ball. They're barely getting any hits in. They have to bring the t-ball thing out. And so Nash is like the last kid up to bat. And I'm like, here we go. He's got really high stakes. He's been doing push-ups. He's been pumping iron with his stuffed animals. And now he's one to get a home run and it probably won't happen so he gets up to bat he kind of looks at me like mom watch this and so he goes and he swings and the kid actually gets a home run he knocks the ball so far he's running all the bases yeah all of the parents were cheering they were like yeah the cubbies could use a player like him like all the parents were excited But the kids on the field were still just doing like the gravel angels, like they didn't really care. And so that night he was like, see mom, I told you it's all about home runs and all about winning. I was like, oh my gosh, pray for us guys. It's going to be a long journey in sports. And so the next morning, Nash wakes up and he was like, mom, I've been thinking about something. I was like, okay. He's like, I need you to get me a new baseball team. I was like, what? He was like, I need you to get me a new baseball team. I was like, why? He's like, those kids, those kids on my team, they don't care about winning. I hit a home run. Nobody cheered. They don't care. I was like, those kids, you are a kid, Nash. Like, it's just meant to be fun. But he cares so much about winning. I actually brought a photo from the last game, and he got a little trophy, And he was so excited until he looked around and he was like, wait, everybody's getting a trophy? I was like, it's this thing they do now. It's like the participation award or whatever. Well, it's another topic for another day. 
Um, but he had so much fun playing baseball, but he really, really, really wanted to win. And I think we can look at that and it makes us laugh and it's cute that he wants to win so much. But the truth is, when it comes to the idea of winning, I think some of us have lost our passion to win. Maybe we've been lulled to sleep. We've settled into the misconception that we're always just going to struggle well. It's always going to be this way. And I think for us as Christ followers, as a church, it's time to get some of that fight back inside of us that says, I'm going to rise up and realize that there is a better way that God designed for me to live. And here's the thing, the stakes are high when it comes to winning because your life matters. Your life matters. And your victory isn't just about you, but it's about those around you as well. And so today, as we begin this brand new series, my prayer is that it would lay a foundation for the coming weeks. Because if you are in a battle and you want to win, it's imperative that you understand the context of the battleground that you are fighting in. Second Chronicles tells us that the battle that we are in is not against flesh and blood, but it is a spiritual battle. We often forget this because we can't see with our physical eyes what's happening in the spiritual realm, but we have to remember that the battle that we fight is not against flesh and blood. And today I want to talk a little bit about this because I think it's going to help to set us up to win. See, we believe that God is a triune being, Father, Spirit, and Son. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23 tells us that we are made in the image of God and also comprised of three elements, the first one being the body or the flesh. Genesis 2, 7 tells us that our bodies are formed from the earth and they act as a temporary house or shell that contains our soul and our spirit. The next one is the soul. Our soul enables us to experience relationships and appreciate the beauty of our surroundings. See, God could have programmed us to be whatever he wanted, but instead he gave us the ability to choose. And our soul is what is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. All the feelings are happening in the soul. And the last element is the spirit. And did you know, such a great reminder for us, something good to think about, is that you are a spiritual being having a temporary physical experience on earth. You're not just a physical being having a temporary spiritual experience. And sometimes we get those things flipped around. And it's important that we remember that we are spiritual beings having a temporary physical experience here on this earth. And these three things are often at odds with one another. It plays into the tension or the battle within that many of us feel. Because the spirit craves one thing, and our flesh, our desire for sin, our flesh craves something totally different. And we have to be cognizant to think about which am I feeding? Because what you feed will grow. It will grow. And the flesh will always try to take the lead. It has a strong appetite and it lets you know when it's hungry. But we have to starve the flesh and instead feed our spirit. See, God's plan is that our spirit becomes the strongest part of our three-part design and be the command center of who we are and what we do. Because what we give the most attention to will become the most influential. It's so true. If you think about in every area of our lives, when you give more and more attention to something, it becomes more and more influential in our lives. Our four-year-old son, who's not so into sports at the moment, but really loves monster trucks, gives a lot of his attention to monster trucks these days. This morning, he came into our bed at 5 a.m. and he said, Mommy, can I watch monster truck videos on your phone? I said, Ryder, it is 5 a.m. I don't even think Jesus is awake yet. No, you cannot watch monster truck videos on my phone. But he gives so much attention to it, it becomes to be very influential in his life. And even though that's a silly example, it can apply to all of us. 
What we give our attention to, our desire, will follow after that. See, God designed us to live with a spiritual order. How many of you are like, you love order, you love lists, like you're an order person, right? God wants us to have a spiritual order in our lives where the spirit would lead the way and the soul and the body or the flesh would be in submission to the spirit. But our spirit can only take the lead if we feed it more than we feed the flesh or the things of the flesh. And Galatians 5 breaks this down even further of what the spirit versus the flesh looks like. And I want to read it for us. It says, for the flesh has desires that are opposed to the spirit. And the spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh. And these are in opposition to each other. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. They're things like sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. See, we want to feed the things of the Spirit and have the byproduct of that. We want our lives to be full of love and joy. Hello, we could use some more joy in our everyday life and peace and kindness. But we have to be mindful that we're feeding the things of the Spirit and not the things of the flesh. And as one of your pastors, I want to let you know that the desires of the flesh will always lie to you. Sin will always lie to you and say, if you do this, then you will be fulfilled. But it will always leave you wanting more. The hookup will not satisfy what you are really longing for. That substance will not give you what you really desire. And as long as we believe that feeding the flesh will satisfy us, we will get caught up in a never-ending cycle that never, ever brings satisfaction. But by the power of the Spirit, we can break free from a cycle or trap or the lie of sin and move into a place where we recognize the Spirit, we feed the Spirit, and we will find spiritual satisfaction, which is amazing and what I think we are all looking for. So the question with this concept, right, is how do we live this out practically? How do we have victory? How does our spirit lead the way? And in the remaining time that we have together, I want to share with you just a little bit about what has changed my life personally. Years ago, I had given my life to Christ. Decades ago, I said, I want to surrender. I don't want to try to be in charge of my own life. I want to follow Jesus. City First, we exist to introduce everyone to Jesus and teach them to follow him. I was like, I want that for my life. So I made that decision to follow Jesus. And Jesus gave me a new life, but I found that I was still caught up in an old mindset. I was working towards behavior modification. This is what a Christ follower should do and act like and look like. And then God revealed to me that he didn't want behavior modification for my life, but he wanted me to have a complete transformation by the power of his spirit. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do you know that our, there's patterns in our world? There's patterns of anxiety, there's patterns of fear, there's patterns of insecurity, there's patterns of control, there's patterns of selfishness. And the Bible says, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but instead be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Did you know that your life moves in the direction of your most dominant thoughts? For a rider, my four-year-old, it's monster trucks, monster trucks, monster trucks. But our life moves in the direction of our most dominant thoughts. 
It's a really, it's a really important concept for us to understand. Even in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart or mind, so is he. So it's really important what our minds are focused on. And I have a question for you today. If there was no one else in here, this is just a question for you to think about and for you to answer for yourself. If your life is moving in the direction of your current most dominant thoughts, I want you to pause. If your life is moving in the direction of your most dominant thoughts, do you like the direction that your life is headed in? Do you want to go where your thoughts are going? Do you want to be following them? Or are you thinking things like it's always going to be this way? There's no hope for this relationship. There's no healing in this marriage. I'm always going to be the victim. I'm always going to be overlooked. I'll never be enough. I'll never have enough. Do you know that we think on average 40,000 thoughts every day? Some people more, some people less. But 80% of those thoughts are negative. And maybe you're going, well, Lisa, if you knew my circumstance, if you knew my situation, you would know why my mind is drifting to negative things. And yet Philippians tells us whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is right, if there is anything could be breath in our lungs, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Think on these things. That's what we're meant to think on. You might have one thing. You are alive. You have breath in your lungs. Give God praise and think about the things that are pure and good because you cannot have a positive life with negative thoughts. They're in contradiction with each other. And this is more than wishful thinking. This is more than trying to manifest happiness. I'm talking about having your mind focus on the power of the living word of God that is sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide between spirit and flesh. We've got to get our thoughts and our minds and our words in alignment with God's words, his truth found in the Bible, because what comes into your mind will come out into your life. What comes into your mind will overflow into your life, and the enemy will custom make lies and thoughts that he wants you to dwell on, but we cannot give way to what the enemy once, we have to choose to guard our hearts and our minds. Proverbs 4.24 says, above all else, above all else, the Greek word there for all is all. Above all else, guard your heart and your mind for everything that you do flows from it. And a lot of times, we are quick to guard everything else quick to guard our reputation. We're quick to guard our bank account. You want me to give to what? We're quick to guard our social media. Did that person really just comment about that? How many followers do I have? We're quick to guard our calendar. You want me to donate my time to? We're quick to guard our image. We're quick to guard our opinion, guard our time, but we can forget to guard our hearts and our minds. And so this week, I want you to focus on guarding your mind, guarding your heart. You're not just going to accept any thought that comes into your mind, but we're going to guard it. Romans 8 says, take, thought ev take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. We do this by identifying the lies we are believing, and then we replace them with God's truth, with God's truth. And even as I have been praying for you this week, and I know I might not get the privilege of knowing every person's name, but I want you to know that at City First Church, you are covered in prayer. As a pastoral team, we pray for you. We love you. I want you to know you are being lifted up in prayer. And so this week, as I was praying for you, I really felt like God just dropped it in my heart that some of you have been believing the same lies for so long you can't even recognize a lie from the truth anymore. You've just accepted whatever that lie is that you've been dwelling on as what it is. And today, my prayer is that you would begin to recognize the lies from the enemy because he would try to custom make those lies for you. And maybe you've been giving those lies so much attention in your life that they've become the most influential thing for you. 
And maybe some of those lies have begun to define you. You think that failure is defining you. Or you think that divorce has defined you. Or that you're not smart enough, or you're not attractive enough, or you'll never be free from that thing. But I want to remind you today to allow the God who designed you to define you and let his truth be your truth. Let what he says about you be what you say about you, that you are free and you are whole and you are healed. So very practically, on a very practical level, as you leave today, I want you to begin to identify the lies that you've been believing. What is it? Maybe you've just, you haven't recognized it. I want you to take the time to identify what is that lie you've been believing. Identify it and then name it. Because what I've learned in my own life is that you cannot defeat what you are unwilling to define. Take the time and define it. What have I been believing that is a lie? And then begin to replace that lie with the truth that comes from God's word. How will you know if it's a lie if it does not line up with God's word, if it does not line up with his character? God loves you. He created you. He literally dreamt you up, designed you. He would not speak ill of you. He wants what's good for you. Anything that's in opposition with that is not from him. So find one verse this week, just one, and then begin to speak that truth into your life every day. Write it out. Memorize it. When I was first trying to live out this transformation by the renewing of my mind, I would be so desperate for truth. I would find a verse. I would write it out. I would read it first thing in the morning, in the afternoon, at night before I went to bed. I had it posted all over the place because I was like, I just want my mind to be renewed. And it began to transform my life. And it takes effort to guard something, but it's going to be worth it when you begin to guard your heart and your mind and make sure your thoughts are in line with God's truth. And you might be going, okay, well, what does that look like? Maybe you've been believing a lie. And whatever your situation is right now, you've just been thinking, this is impossible. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's a financial situation, a health situation. You've just been going, this is, this is impossible. And you've been believing that lie. Because what does God's truth says, say? In Luke 18, 27, God says, all things, all things are possible with me. Nothing is impossible for our God. Maybe you've been believing this line thinking, I don't have enough faith for whatever the opposition is that's in front of you. But God says, I have given everyone, everyone, it might be your first day in church, God has given everyone no exceptions. He's given everyone a measure of faith in Romans 12 too. Maybe you think, I'm not smart enough I'm not smart enough to figure out the things that are before me, but God says in 1 Corinthians 1.30, I give you wisdom and wisdom in abundance. Maybe you feel like you are all alone. For whatever reason, you just feel so incredibly lonely. Would you know what God has to say about that? In Hebrews 13.5, so he says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you and I am with you always. Maybe you've been believing the lie, I cannot go on. I just can't do it. I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. I don't have the provisions. I can't go on. But God says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that my grace is sufficient for you. His grace and his mercy is available for you today. Maybe you think, I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid to step out. I'm too afraid to take a step forward. I'm just too afraid to do what God is even asking me to do. But in 2 Timothy 1.7, God says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Maybe you think nobody loves me, but God says in John 13.6 that he loves you. John 3.16, it's like the most famous verse. I screwed it up. John 3.16, God loves you. Maybe you've done something that you think is unforgivable. You think, I just can't forgive myself, or God couldn't forgive me for what I did. You're like, it's a miracle that I'm in church today or watching online. And you feel like you can't forgive yourself, or you don't deserve God's forgiveness. But John 1, 9, God says, I forgive you. And in Psalm 103, 12, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so have your sins been removed from you. It's time to receive God's forgiveness and also forgive yourself. 
It's so important that we know the truth because when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. And so this week, your homework assignment is to identify that one lie and then replace that lie with God's truth. Find a verse, memorize it, meditate on it, write it out, think about it, share it with somebody, but let's be renewed, let's be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Let me pray for us, church. God, I thank you so much for each and every person who's part of City First Church. God, I thank you for the plan and the purpose that you have for their lives, that you desire that we walk in that spiritual order with the Spirit leading the way. So may we be people who feed the Spirit. God, may we be people who meditate on your truth and believe it and think it and speak it. And God, I pray that we would stop believing the lies of the enemy and we will begin to believe what you have to say. God, we thank you for who you are and that your truth transforms, that your truth transforms us. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, you know, we say that the truth will set us free. And the truth is not a thing, but it's a person, Jesus Christ. And if you've never made the decision to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of your life, we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. If that's you, would you just quietly, no one's, slipping, no one's looking around, would you just quietly but boldly slip up your hand and say, today I want to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of my life, in person and online. I see, hand, I see your hand. There's hands going up all over the place. And once you raise your hand, you can go ahead and put that back down. Best decision you'll ever make. Without, so that no one feels like they're having to say this alone, church, can we all repeat this prayer after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Today I choose to make him the leader and the forgiver of my life. Thank you for a fresh start. And in your name we pray, amen. Church, can we give everybody who made that decision a huge round of applause? Best decision you will ever make. Church, may we walk in victory this week, knowing that God is with us and his word is true. We love you so much.